In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. John was a wild man, an agent of change, on the move, no place to call home, driven by the word that came to him in the wilderness. He is a stark contrast to the long list of leaders that Luke gives us, starting with the emperor and working its way down through the ranks to the local boss, safe in their grand palaces with power over life and death. Their job was to keep a stable status quo. John's job was to overthrow it, to shake things up and make a mess, to expose the lies of those proud men. He called people to repentance, to turn their lives around away from sin and toward God and he offered baptism as a symbol of that transformation. The cleansing waters stripping away the old self of sin so that someone new could emerge reborn and ready ready for the baptism to come through the purifying power of the Holy Spirit brought by Jesus. John's work was radical, scandalous, dangerous. Eventually he lost his life. But for many people his work was their sole hope for freedom. Freedom from control of an oppressive and corrupt regime. Quoting the prophet Isaiah, John cast a vision of what would be. He saw hills and mountains leveled, valleys filled, rough terrain made smooth, crooked paths straight. Those obstacles would be no more. The way made clear for Jesus to come and for people to come to Jesus so that we can walk the way of faith and see clearly a horizon that has been blocked for far too long. That's inspiring and exciting and if we're honest a little frightening. This wild man whose voice still echoes strongly uncompromising and urgent calling us out to follow the straight path of faith to make a mess, to reject and upturn the ways of the world, come what may, cost what it will. But we wonder, how do we do that? Where do we even start? Well, we start where John did, in the wilderness. Not literally. You don't have to go out to the sands of New Mexico. No, figuratively. In a spiritual sense, we need to go to the wilderness. It's a precarious place, not very comfortable, sparse and raw. Sounds dreadful, and it can be. None of us really want to go to the wilderness, but we all need to, because there we can receive change. The gift of the wild is that we see things we often miss. The stark, unfamiliar landscape breaks off our blinders and our complacency and brings fresh perspective. And if you've ever been to the desert, a wasteland also has its own strange beauty and peacefulness about it. Because in that barren space, we learn what gratitude really means. But again, we're left wondering, how do we get to the wilderness? Repent from sin to receive forgiveness. We can't get rid of something if we don't know that we have it. And being in the wilderness means some soul searching. 
at its heart, sin is what gets in the way of our relationship with God, whatever that might be. Sin is an obstacle. It's the hills and the mountains that need to be laid low. Sin is the valley that needs to be filled in our lives. When we go into the wilderness, we're hunting for sin. We're hunting for what messes up our connection with God, and that's uncomfortable. But when we find it, we can choose to change it. We can ask for forgiveness and receive it, and we can ask for the grace to accept forgiveness and forgive ourselves. Because that's really the tough part, isn't it? And then we're set free. Free to see life in a new way. And that vision can give us the power to prophesy. Now, we often think of prophecy as a purview of a select few chosen by God and endowed with very special gifts. We think of people like Malachi and John and Isaiah. And the idea that we might have a prophetic role seems ridiculous. And while it is true that God has given a select few extraordinary prophetic powers, this does not mean that only biblical figures have the gift. In his letters, St. Paul has lists of spiritual gifts, and prophecy appears in them multiple times. So whether we like it or not, some of us go into the wilderness, face our sin, repent, receive forgiveness, and wind up with prophetic powers. Yet those powers are so misunderstood. A prophet is not a soothsayer or a psychic, someone who can magically predict the future. Remember, John and Jesus were cousins. They almost certainly spent time together. John saw in Jesus something others could not see. And that's what a prophet is. A person who perceives the truth about what's happening in the world when others cannot see it. A prophet sees idolatry and injustice for what it is, a violation of God's will and of our covenant with God. A prophet sees what needs to change and how it can be changed and what will happen if it does not change. And faithful prophets do not remain silent. Prophets speak, come what may, cost what it will. But we do need to be cautious. There is such a thing as false prophets, people who confuse their opinions with God's truth. Again, St. Paul wrote that the gift of prophecy is to be discerned within the context of a prayerful community that holds each other accountable. But those who have the gift need to speak humbly, yet boldly as Jesus did and as John did. John confronted the political and religious elite, challenged their power by professing the power of Jesus come to save. There are things wrong with this world, big things. And lots of people can't see. But prophets can. And nobody can change what they can't see. Prophets need to speak. So, we've been to the wilderness. We've seen our sin. We've repented and received forgiveness and newness of life and a more godly perspective on reality. Some of us have been granted the gift of prophecy. By the way, the word prophet means messenger. And all of us have received spiritual gifts to be messengers each in our own way. Now what? We do what John did, and we call people to come. At the same time, though, like John, we need to stay on the move. As church, we sometimes expect people to come to us. We've got the sign out front and the big red doors. Come on. But it didn't work that way back then, and it certainly does not work that way now. 
Had John stood in only one place crying out in the wilderness, it's hard to imagine many people hearing him. Instead, he went to all the regions around the Jordan. He was a wild man on the move. There are two ways as church we need to move. The first is fairly obvious. When we leave here, we cannot remain silent, prophet or no. We need to reach out to people with the good news to witness our own experience of grace and love. And when we speak, we need to meet people where they are. The work of evangelism is not to impose, but to invite and entice. It's like a courtship. Or better yet, it's like being a matchmaker, trying to hook people up with Jesus. We need to move from here into the world with courage, sharing the precious gift of forgiveness and freedom, despite the fact that some will reject the message and even mock us for trying to share it. Now, that's the first way the church needs to be on the move. The second way the church needs to move is less obvious and perhaps even less popular than the idea of being an evangelist. As church, we need to move into the future, and that means change. We need to understand and adapt to the culture around us. If we don't understand our mission field, then our work together on God's behalf will be stunted and eventually will wither. Now this does not mean throwing away our goodly heritage or compromising on our core values or watering down the gospel to some easy sell, feel good entertainment. We've got to be honest with people about both the joy and the challenges of following Jesus as a disciple. But as a church, we cannot stay where we have always been when it comes to how we do certain things. Some of our habits and patterns act as obstacles to people seeking Jesus. Yet we are called to prepare the way of the Lord to get rid of those obstacles, to level mountains and backfill valleys so that the way is clear for Jesus to come into people's lives, so that the way is clear for people to make Jesus part of their lives. John was a wild man. He was an agent of change, on the move, driven by the word that came to him in the wilderness. His job was to shake things up, make a mess, and proclaim the coming of Christ. It was radical and scandalous work and dangerous. He literally lost his head for it. And it's our job too. His work is our work. A work that is inspiring and exciting and a little bit frightening, but work that is 100% non-optional for people who follow Jesus. But it is definitely not boring. And to me, that's the worst fate in the world. The life of faith is not boring, it's the adventure of a lifetime. And it returns to us a thousandfold, whatever we put into it. Through Christ, we are greatly blessed. And it would be selfish not to share it with others. And what a joy it is to give. It's that time of year. We're shopping and looking forward to the ones that we love opening up their gifts. And this is the greatest gift of all. The hope that things as they are need not be and shall not be. The gift that the freedom and the peace from guilt and shame that comes from forgiveness can be received by all. The gift of the love of Jesus that accepts everyone as they are, where they are, so that all of us might be moved to a better place.